37 to 36. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you'll be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. You'll bow your heads with me. We'll start in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for all of your mercies, all of your great, wonderful things that you do, the blessings that you give us, Father. We thank you for the laughter and the joy of the children, the heritage that they bring us, Lord. Help us to take seriously our role in raising them. Lord, prick our hearts today. Let the Spirit speak to us, and Lord, help us to open our ears and be obedient to your words, Father. This is some powerful and... Um, crazy teaching. I'll just put that out there right now that, that is exactly the crazy life that Jesus lived for us because of the crazy love that he had for us. And Father, you know I mean no disrespect in that. It is just amazing how much love that you have for us. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I, I picture Jesus when he's doing all that saying, blessed are you. I'm going to wake you up a little bit. And woe to you. And then Mark, I expect him to look all around after that, after he was looking directly at the twelve and say, but to you who are listening, are you listening? Because so many times it goes one ear and out the other, and it does. We read scripture all the time, we know what it says, and we get so angry with somebody that we act this way or that way. And it can be something as simple as somebody cutting you off while driving down the road, right? So we need to pray for the Spirit's guidance. We need to realize exactly how Jesus Christ lived because Jesus Christ is God in the flesh dwelling among us, Emmanuel, laying down his life because God so loved the world that he did not want anyone to perish but all have eternal life. And you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. From the beginning of time as we know it, God had planned for the good works for you to do, to be his masterpiece, to draw others, as though the ministry of reconciliation that he was offering, he was offering through you. So I entitled this sermon, A Life of Agape Love. And you need to understand what agape love is because love is a term that we have one word for, really, and we love French fries and we love Jesus. There's a big difference there. But in the Greek, there's four words for, for love, and agape is a godly love that you cannot have because it's the kind of love that you can love even your enemies. It is a supernatural love. You will not understand it unless you're born again by, by the blood of Jesus Christ and unless you submit to him as Lord, follow in his footsteps. It's something that you, as a baby, might get a little bit of, and I mean a baby in, in the word in, the, in your Christian life, but as you mature more and more, you'll get more comprehension to understand how great the depth of God's love is for you. So I ended last week's sermon with, <clears throat> are we living for this life, for the temporary pleasures? Are we living for King Jesus and his eternal kingdom? 
We need to, we need to contemplate that. Because most days we live for ourselves much more than we live for God's kingdom. Because we say, oh, we're not called to, by God to go out and be an evangelist in, in this foreign land or whatever. So we go about living our day and put Jesus beside of us instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus. Every day is a day to be a child of the kingdom of heaven. And you have a, have a testimony to present to others in word and deed every single day. You interact with other people. You interact with the people in your family for sure every single day if you don't go outside of your family. And you can be a blessing to your spouse, to your children, whatever that may be, instead of taking for granted your life purchased, your eternal life purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. The life you choose to live as a Christian is the only heaven that some will ever see. And if you are saved, this world in all of its suffering, everything else, and we don't suffer too much, will be the only hell that you ever see. And our goal should be that for everyone else, that they can see the hope that we have and they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In this country and in this time, we have one of the greatest opportunities in history to live out the Beatitudes, the blessings. We are not persecuted in this country. We have an abundance of wealth. We have free time. But what do we do with that? Do we use it for, to build up our idols, to build up our kingdoms on shifting sands? Or do we use it to build up the kingdom? You can go out and witness to whoever you want, help whoever you want, without persecution right now. Are you doing it? Because if you're not doing it now when persecution comes, you're probably not going to do it then. You have a, the choice to decide whether to live out blessings, beatitudes, or woes, which leads to cursing. The complete opposite of being blessed, which is the right standing of God, are found in verse 24 to 26. But woe to you who are rich now, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Now remember, Jesus came down to a level place after picking the twelve, and he's told them, hey, here's what you're signing up for you, and blessed are you when you are poor. Blessed are you when you are hungry. Blessed are you when you weep. Blessed when you are ridiculed, persecuted, and even beaten for my name. He's telling them, this is what you've signed up for. If you're going to follow me, if you deny yourself, you will take up your cross if you're going to follow after me. And now he switches to the woes. And woe is not a cursing. A woe is a wake-up call. It's a warning that a curse is coming because you still are in your sinful state. You are still living for the king of, of this world rather than King Jesus, even if you have saving grace. So he says, but to you who are rich now. So he's still talking to the twelve, but he's talking, and, he's, and each time he's talking to everyone that's willing to listen, but he's saying, you already, you who are rich and decide to live not necessarily because you have all of this physical abundance, but you think you're rich. As Jesus says to the churches in Revelation, you think you have what you need because you've got daily bread. You've got a place to lay your head. You're rich. The ones that follow after me won't have a place to lay their head. Are you sure you want to follow after the Son of Man? You who are rich and live for your riches, the comforts of this world, because that's what you've got your life fixed on, you've already received that comfort. Paul tells us that we have the ultimate comfort from God so that we can comfort others. So part of the reason we go through the hardships and trials and sufferings that we go through is so that we have some common ground. Wow, look what Jesus went through for us so that we have a Savior that can empathize with us in our pain. And we know that He never will forsake us, that He's always with us, that all we've got to do is let Him lift us up out of our troubles, and that not one hair on our head will be harmed outside of God's will. But for you want to live in your comfort that you are now, you've already received that comfort. 
Woe to you who are well fed now, whether, like I said, you're eating bread or you're eating filet mignon. There will be a point when you don't have those things anymore. When you spend time in eternity and you think that it might not be that bad, I remember so many times I would get from the youth group, well, if my friends are going to be there, it'll be all right. <laughs> you won't even know anything but the parched tongue that you have contem contemplating how you could get a drop of water. Remember Lazarus and the beggar that was outside, or the rich man in Lazarus, the beggar who was outside, and he longed for scraps off the rich man's table, but he wouldn't give them to him because he had no comfort, no compassion, no mercy. Woe to you who laugh now, who enjoy this life, no matter how much you're caught up in the things of this world, or you're just laughing because it's a good time. You've been blessed with children, and, and like I said, you've got a place to lay your head, and you're outside rolling in the grass. But your life is not focused on your salvation in the King of Kings and the salvation of others. Because remember, that's why the disciples were weeping. They were weeping because of the state of the nation of Israel and the state of the nation of the world. Because they chased and longed after the idols of all the other foreign lands. Woe to everyone who speaks well of you. Because that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. That is in direct opposition to the first statement that says that's how they treated the prophets. Here's how you treat the false prophets. The false prophets weren't ridiculed. They weren't sawn in half. They weren't beheaded. Because they gave a message that sounded like it was coming from God. It might even have some, hey, you need to change your answers and stuff. But it wasn't the true message to repent and turn to God and get rid of all of those other idols that you chase after. There's only one person sitting on the throne, and that is King Jesus. That is a fact. But who is sitting on the throne of your heart? Are you sharing that throne with Jesus? Is something sharing that throne with Jesus? We tend to, even the good things that we have, like our children put them on a th the throne with Jesus. And there's no place on the throne except for Jesus. So will you be blessed in the world's way or will you be blessed in Christ's way? Let me remind you again, blessed are you who are poor. Even if it leads to poverty, you use your wealth for the kingdom. For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now. If it reaches the point where you don't have daily bread, you can pray for it and God will give it to you because you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now or mourn, for you will laugh and be comforted. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, persecute you, insult you, and reject your name as evil. All of this lifestyle that you've chosen because of the Son of Man. Because you consider your life as garbage or rubbish, as Paul says, compared to the knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ and living obedient to His commands and following in His footsteps. Rejoice in that day when you are persecuted and even leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. Not only do you have a reward in heaven, but because you have chosen to follow after King Jesus, great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Look at all of the Old Testament. Look how the prophets were rejected because people didn't want to turn to God and turn away from idols. They wanted to have half-hearted devotion. Read any Old Testament book pretty much. And it shows you the adultery of man toward God because they had other loves. And God has a love so great for you that His only Son He sent to die for your sins, to be ridiculed, to be tormented, to be crushed so that God wouldn't have to take out His wrath upon you. So we have to take some of the things that people teach and get them out of here. Is Jesus teaching that riches are bad? No. We've got to look at this in the context of Scripture. This is Jesus' first teachings and they're... I used the word crazy before. I'm outlandish, <laughs> uh, Im impossible. You wouldn't expect this kind of teaching from the, the rabbi at this point, but it's exactly the teaching that Jesus gives. 
Put up or shut up? Are you serious or not? Will you follow me or not? Do you understand the great salvation that you have and the importance of being an ambassador for Christ? Do you realize this? No, not everyone will be called out to the mission field, but everyone is called to be like Christ, to be obedient, to be sanctified, to be set apart and holy for God's service. What else can you do that is reasonable but offer spiritual sacrifices which are pleasing to God? You need to have your mind transformed. You need to be set apart from the world, different from them living in this world as a foreigner or an alien. We read on in scriptures that it's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil or the root of all evil. It's not riches. There are plenty of people in the Old Testament, again, that are rich in the New Testament that are rich and use their riches to help others, to fight injustice and poverty, to spread the kingdom of heaven. Even Jesus' ministry was sponsored by wealthy women. So do you use the things that you are rich in, whether it's your talents, your gifts, your money, your time, whatever that you have that you're rich in, do you use that for the kingdom of heaven because you realize the blessed state that you're in because you have a right standing with God. Are you willing to follow the master's way? So Jesus has called all men to repentance, so he's told them about blessings and he has given them warnings of the woes that are ahead of them. And if you notice, there were four blessings and there are four woes. Poor versus rich. Hungry versus well-fed, weeping versus laughing, spoken evil of versus spoken well of, all, be, all based on your faith and how you put your faith into actions. As James says, show me your faith by your deeds. So how do you view this world and how do you view your life? Do you view it differently than you used to when you were a pagan, when you were a Gentile? Scripture's clear about that. Or do you still chase after the same things and put Jesus into the mix? Whose king and whose kingdom are you truly living for? In Matthew 12, Jesus says these words, verse 34, You brood of vipers, you poisonous snakes that cause death when they bite. How can you who are evil say, and I'll put in there, this is not in the scripture, or do anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good, store, the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. So are you a viper? What kind of things are you bringing out of your heart? Oh, let's talk about our attitude again. It's something as simple as someone slamming the door in your face or someone cutting you off in traffic. What's your thought process? And then what are your actions after that? Because it says clearly here, a man brings good things out of good stored up in him. Oh, let me give you a New Living Translation version. version. A good man or woman, let's put that in there just to get you ladies, brings out good things out of the good stored up in them. So what's stored up in you? An evil man brings evil out of the evil stored up in him. Every time that I think an evil thought, and especially do an evil action, first thing I try to do, because the scripture's coming at me, because the Holy Spirit has revealed that to me and is flooding me with that, so that he can lead me into all truth, is I ask for forgiveness right then, which changes my heart, which changes my mindset. I don't care what they did. They have to answer them. Some, I always say to somebody when they come out and say that, is, you're not accountable for them. You're accountable for yourself. How did you just react and what did you just do? doesn't matter what they did to you. That's part of this. That's exactly how Jesus went before the cross. But I tell you, that everyone will give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. You piece of crap, you just cut me off. That's the thought, so I'll just let it come out. I bid my thought. It might not be yours, but it's mine, and if not it's yours. <laughs> and then, like I said, what do you do? Do you speed up and try to cut them off? Do you give them that fabulous waving sign that I'm not going to do up here? I mean, what do you do? 
Or do you say, bless them on something, something that simple and pray for them? Pray that instead of the hurries in this world, which you face all the time too, and see that maybe just they'll hear some silence for a minute and contemplate the God of all creation that loves them so much that He gave His one and only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. For by the words, for by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Do we take this salvation seriously? Do we do it with holy reverence and fear? Paul says this to the church in Corinthians, and he's been there a couple times and, and written letters, and he still has to say this. 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. That's sobering. Every idle thought, every action. I don't know how long it's take, but in my lifetime, it's going to take a little bit of time come judgment day. I don't know how it'll happen, anything else. And I won't feel good about any of these bad things I've done because I knew better and the Holy Spirit lived inside of me and should have been guiding me into all truth. Jesus has already told us at this point how to be rewarded, not only rewarded, but greatly rewarded. He's told us to jump for joy when we're pers persecuted. And people say things about us that aren't fair, that aren't true, that we want to defend ourselves. But vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Jesus tells you to live a blessed life because you are blessed. And here's how to do it. So how is your mindset? And then how are you living your life? Agape love, like I said before, is a supernatural, godly love that is not common to us. It's not anything that we can do on our own because if you understand it to the utmost, you can love even your enemy as Christ loved his enemies and gave up his life. For the joy he went before the cross. He went silently and did not open his mouth knowing that he had no, done nothing wrong whatsoever. And he just came into Jerusalem as Hosanna, the king of kings. And yet now the crowds were yelling, crucify him, crucify him, and beat him, as Isaiah said, to the point where he was not recognizable as a human being. We tend to live more by our emotions than by the Spirit of God. We get an emotion, and then... We react upon it, don't we? So what's the good stored up in your heart versus the bad stored up in your heart? Because what should your emotion be? I'll give that simple thing again as if you get cut off in traffic. Do you immediately go to the person doesn't know any better and you didn't know any better at one point, but now you do, so you should do better and you should bless them and pray for them? And that's a simple thing again. We're not talking about the people who do you evil. We're talking about simply somebody who did something that wasn't courteous or nice. If you have the mindset of Christ, it changes everything that you think about and changes the things that you do. It's, a, it's not just obeying the law. We spend too much time trying to obey the law. Thou shalt not steal. Where the, what Jesus is teaching now, his mindset is, I know I shouldn't steal and I have things, so how can I do good with them? to fight poverty and injustice. Oh, I am merciful and compassionate just because of the state they're in. It brings me to that point of mercy and showing them grace, something that they don't deserve. Matthew 9, 12, and 13, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. Remember this is said right after Matthew leaves his tax booth to follow Jesus. He leaves all the riches of this world behind. He will be ridiculed. He possibly will be hunted down and everything. But all he can do at this point is, is throw a party for all of his scumbag friends because he wants them to know Jesus. Is that what's important in your life? Because you know what it means to... Be merciful rather than it means to tithe on the tenth of your mint and everything. 
The law points out how wicked we are, but the law is supposed to show us through the lens of Jesus Christ how good God is and how good His children should be. Not by our own might, not by our own way to love, but by this agape love that we understand for God so loved. Guess what happens after you have the mindset of Jesus and you understand these meanings? That old flesh starts to go away. And that new creation in Christ starts to shine more and more. You act more on mercy and grace rather than on self-indulgence and selfishness. When you see the poor, instead of pointing fingers at them, you want to give to them to help them regardless of why they're in that state. When you see those that are sad, you want to comfort them because you've been comforted. Woe, woe, woe to you who are rich now and don't share your riches, who are well-fed and don't share your food. Those that you see that are downcast, saddened, heartbroken, and you don't want to lend them a helping hand and tell them about Jesus Christ in the process. It's not just about obeying. It's about understanding God's love, and that's what compels you to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, and to love others as yourself, which is written in the law. But Jesus says, a new command I'm giving you. It's nothing new, but he's showing you how to live it now and giving you the power to live it. It is an attitude based off the heart because of the blessed state that you're in towards God and towards others that will even lead you to the point of loving your enemies to the point of death to save their soul. This kingdom living here on earth, it brings new meaning to the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, not mine, but thy kingdom come in heaven and on earth. I'm supposed to be a child of the King of Heaven, represented it here, Christ's ambassador, a foreigner in this land, living like Christ so much that I am ushering in the kingdom and I am loving and doing loving acts that's changing this world from the state that it's in. Instead, we look to the government to offer those programs because we don't want to do them ourselves. But we tithe our mint. What is your heart fake focused on? So then there's the golden rule, right? You all know what that is. Do you practice it? There's a repair shop in Spokane, Golden Rule Break, if you know that. And their story is a testimony. I, I had to read it the other day. It said, and it's gone from generation to generation, if you go read their story. And they want to be honest because that's how they want to be treated. Golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. But there's so much more than just being honest. There is action called to mercy and grace. Look at your Old Testament again and see the, the, the kings and leaders that understood this and changed the kingdoms here on earth. Even Cyrus the Great, who was a pagan king, brought about so much reform. And wherever he conquered places, they became better because of what he offered them because he didn't want them in this poor state. He cared about human beings, and he was a pagan. How much more should we live like Christ in this world? Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. You've got to have a new mindset. They are darkened in their understanding and they're separated from the life of God, the life that you need to live, that He desires for you to live, this created before the beginning of times to, be, to do good works, His masterpiece in Christ Jesus from Ephesians 2.10. <clears throat> They are darkened in their mind and understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Ignorance is not a bad thing. Ignorance means you don't know. The reason you don't know is you're ignorant because your heart is hardened. You've got a new heart of flesh. The Holy Spirit should be molding that so that you are pliable in the way your heart does to change the way you think, to change the way you act, so that you're compassionate just as Jesus was compassionate for you. 
that you love just as Jesus loved you, that you show mercy just as Jesus showed mercy to you. Having lost all sensitivity, verse 19, they have given themselves over to sensuality. Nothing has changed so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. One of the biggest reasons that people don't go to church on Sunday is it's their day. It's not a day for the Lord. It's their day off to go enjoy their things in this world. Even if they don't have many physical things that their money could buy, just their family. Their day to sleep in, whatever it is. It's not a holy day except for themselves. It's set apart for themselves. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life that you learned. Follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ who gave up heaven, riches we can't fathom, to become flesh and blood and to live without a place to lay his head, as Scripture says, and then was tormented and crucified unto death. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were, were, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now I've got to stop here and examine my own life and see my shortcomings and ask God to increase my faith and it call to action. Therefore, each, you, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing, now Paul gives these examples just like we're going to read about in Luke again that Jesus gives. Anyone who should be... was has been stealing, must no longer steal. That's the law, right? We're not going to do that. But instead, he must work. He must do something instead of stealing. That's changing the way that he lived. Doing something useful with their own hands. Why? That they may have something to share with those in need. It's Jesus' exact words here that Paul's saying again. He's saying, if you're a thief, quit because it's wrong. But if you're a thief, also start working so you can do good for others, not so you can have things, or you'd be going right back to that same mindset. You wouldn't be stealing anymore, but you'd be living for your own lives, your own selves. I think i got to put a lot of Christians in that spot right there because they don't realize the part about doing good. <clears throat> do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others. How many times do you do that? Oh, yeah, in the church it's prayer requests or, <laughs> that are a form of gossip, you know. How many times are you saying to someone and we're saying about someone something that is helpful to build them up? According to their needs that, they may be, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. There's no more examples here from Paul, but he puts it very strong with the two that he gave. Don't steal anymore. Instead, work and give. Don't say anything bad. Instead, say things that are building up and edifying to others. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God who sealed you on the day, for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as Christ God forgave you. Follow God's examples, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, practicing the golden rule, learning what blessings and woes mean, and living a mindset and a heart driven by Christ, compelled to love and fighting injustice in this world. Walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Oh, how is this walk of love? To give up my life to save others. Am I doing that? Sure, I'll pray for somebody when they ask for prayer and it'll last a little while. Maybe there's a lot of heartfelt compassion in it. 
But am I driven by that enough that I keep on and keep on and keep on praying for them? How many times have we heard the stories about a grandmother that prayed for her grandchildren and on her deathbed found out that one of them came to, to, to Christ? How much did that faithful grandmother pray? What would have been the differences if she didn't? I don't know, but I know if, if I have a true heart of Jesus Christ, I am never going to give up praying for my grandchildren. And it should be that way even for my enemies. This is the way of a Christian. Or is it? Because most Christians I know haven't stopped grumbling and complaining. Most Christians I know have stopped stealing, but not necessarily have a heart of giving. What if instead of living the life that we live that we call Christians now, we live like Christ and concentrated on doing good instead of concentrated on not doing wrong? We're right back with the Pharisees with the law. If we continue to try to not do what is wrong, instead we're supposed to live a life of love all the way to enemies dying for them on a cross. Maybe even enemies would become friends, and maybe even enemies would become saved. Maybe this world would look a lot different. Peter tells the believers this in 1 Peter 1st chapter 3, starting in verse 8. Finally, all of you, be like-minded. This is the, God, the purpose of the church, that we all need to do this. Be sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you might inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. Not just turn from evil and I'm okay. I'm in a right standing with God. He has called me to do good. To be an ambassador, to be a witness. Jesus' last words to the, to the twelve or to the eleven were... You don't need to know about the times or seasons or anything else. You don't need to worry about any of these things. But when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you will be my witnesses. That's also, you could translate, you will be my martyrs. Because you're willing to die and spread the gospel message by proclaiming and by living it rather than living your own life or living a life that just adheres to the law. <clears throat> do not repay evil or with evil or insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because of this you were called so that you might inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it to chase after peace. For the eyes of the Lord are, all, are on the righteous, and His ears are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. We put in there a woe. I don't do evil. That's the first thing I want to say as a Christian. But if I'm not doing good, am I not doing evil? Because I'm doing my selfish things instead. The things that I want to build up. That I love money more than I love my friends, my family, my enemy. There's nothing wrong with the rich man saying he wanted to build bigger barns. The, motive, the reason it was wrong was his motive. It was so that he could store his stuff. If he wanted to store it so that he could feed people when they were in need, there would have been nothing wrong with building a bigger barn. He would have had even more possessions, more to pay taxes on. But he would have had it filled with crops that he could have helped others. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, nor be frightened. But, since you have no fear of what's going to happen to you, anything else, you've lived such a good life, you've hungered, you've not had a place to lay your head, you've been persecuted physically and uh, with speech, what do you do? But in your hearts you revere Christ as Lord. That part gets missed out of that verse all the time. Because we use it for the, the fact of giving apologetics, for giving a reason, for a defense for us. 
The first thing comes with revering in your hearts Christ is Lord. That He is King and He is King alone. And if you realize that, then you have the mindset of Christ again, the, the heart that compels you that Christ has given you. You're, you're listening to the Holy Spirit that is guiding you and transforming you, guiding you into all truth. And then always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks, to give the reason for the hope that you have, because you live a life based on hope. This that you can't see in this world, but you know that you are blessed, that you're already seated in heavenly realms, as Scripture tells you, that your sins have been forgiven, that your life is not your own, that your children are a blessing and a heritage from God, that you're thankful for all things, the rain that comes, the, the drought that comes, whatever it is, in any circumstance, Paul says that he is completely okay with it because he can do all things through Christ who gives him strength. And he pours out his life as an offering so that it might be pleasing unto the Lord. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience to those who speak maliciously against your good behavior again, the things you do, in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will for you to suffer for doing good than doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He is put to death in the body, but made alive in the Spirit. Are you alive in the Spirit? Are you living by the power of the Holy Spirit? There once was a duck. It was a free duck, a wild duck. I'm going to use free instead of wild just for my, my story. He was free. He was free to go wherever he wanted. He flew from here to there. But one day he looked down instead of looking up, and he saw this nice farm where all these tame ducks were. Let me, let me put a different word to tame. They were captive ducks. Their wings had been clipped. They couldn't fly away. Wild Duck didn't know that. He just saw the farm, saw, saw the, the farmer going out and feeding the ducks, thought, hey, there's a pond right there, there's food right there, shelter. There's even these little houses I can go in out of the rain. So he decided to go down there and check it out as his flock flew on by. Next winter came. He heard his flock coming by. He looked up. Said, you know, I think I should be up there with them. But I'm kind of comfortable here. And the flock flew on by. Next year, same thing. A few years down the road, his flock come honking, or that'd be a goose, quacking. <laughs> we start, we're talking about ducks. And he never looked up. The sound was unfamiliar to him because he was content in the life that he lived. He didn't know he was meant to fly any longer. He didn't know he was meant to be free. He concentrated on the things of this world. Next winter came. Farmer needed a Christmas duck. You will be accountable for every thought let alone words and actions. So are your eyes fixed on Jesus? Are they fixed on building up treasures in heaven? Jesus again says to build up treasures. He doesn't say to not. He says it's an active thing, that you're to build treasures in heaven. And you do that by being the least of these. That's how you're the greatest. Woe to those who live for yourself and for today. For you have received all that you will ever get. And then you will face judgment. Before going on to verse 27, I want you to think of the greatest act of love ever imagined and done. That God, who created all things, who is beyond our comprehension, that yes, we want to strive to know the incredible greatness and the riches of God, but you'll never comprehend them. Not in this world. I, I don't even know that we will in heaven because I think that's part of why we will continue to bow down and praise because it will all be new every day how great God is so that we'll never be able to stop praising Him. 
But the greatest gift that anyone could ever give is God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I asked the kids Wednesday night when I was teaching them in a large group, and I said, why, why didn't God himself come down and die on the cross? Now, I'm not talking about the Trinity or anything, because yes, God, the Son, uh, Father, Son, and Spirit are one, but why was it the Son who came? And they contemplated a little bit, and I said, ask your Father behind you what would be easier, for him to come to the cross or for one of his children to come to the cross? And Glenn said, no way could he send his children to the cross. He would come himself. But God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son to die for you so that you might be saved, be born again, not face God's wrath, but also so that you would live for him, ushering in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus in John 13, 21, after setting the example of a new kind of love where he washed his disciples' feet, including Judas, it says he was deeply troubled in his spirit because what Judas was going to go do. He had no enmity for Judas. He had a heart full of love that broke his spirit because Judas was not going to turn and come to him. He was going to choose the love of money instead of the love of God in Christ Jesus. And then after that, we get a new command I've given you, to love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So we've had four blessings, four woes. Now we have four ways of agape love. That's why I told you agape love. Love enemies. Do good for them, bless them, and pray for them. Really? I mean, we've already got some, as I said, not disrespectful anyway, crazy teachings, something outlandish that I can never obtain, and now I'm supposed to love my enemies, do good to them, not just love them, not just not say bad things about them, you know, because saying bad things about them would be wrong, but I'm supposed to flip that because that's the love of Christ. That's the love that compels us on the cross to do good, to ask for blessings for them, and to pray for them. Because you don't want to see them spend an eternity apart from God. So you're not doing a love that's of the world, not a love motivated by good deeds or anything else, but a love motivated by God demonstrated in Jesus Christ. Luke 6, verse 27. But to you who are listening, we've already had these other things. Are you listening? Listening means, we know it already, means obeying. Hear, O Israel, the word of God. Hear and obey. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Praise for those, pray for those who mistreat you. Let me give you an example. If someone slaps you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks. If in anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Golden rule, to do to others as you would have them do to you. That's why golden rule break, don't get me wrong, golden rule break, can't just say you want to be honest with them. <laughs> it says to do to others what you would have them done to you. Yes, Honesty leads to this, and yes, giving a fair price is doing thing, one thing, but it's so much more here because he's, J Jesus has already said, if someone slaps you on your cheek, turn to them the other also. This was a sign of disrespect, and you're supposed to just say, ah, it's okay, here's the other one, and not do it in a condescending manner. If someone comes in and demands a coat, you're supposed to take your shirt off, which leaves you naked and exposed. Give to everyone who asks. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. They come in and steal from you, and you're not to demand it back. Is Jesus serious or not? Is this literal or not? Yes, no. Yes, no. Because he's not telling us to be continually beat because there are people that would take advantage of you and kill you. 
And that might not be what God intended for you in that point. It's the heart again. Do you have a heart to love your enemies? To love them enough to not say anything bad about them anymore, but to do good for them, to bless them, to pray for them. Even if it comes down to one of these things, would you be willing to do that or is that where you drew the line? Because you're not willing to. And are you willing to take Scripture and twist it and say, well, the Bible says not in this, this other passage that, that if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Are you neglecting mercy and grace? I understand that passage is there and it, it, it calls for a time of wisdom. But there is a time when just mercy and grace kind of trumps it all, doesn't it, if that's what's compelled in your spirit. That you don't worry about why this person's in this state. You give them food to eat. You offer them a place to sleep. That's why the script, New Testament is full of scriptures about hospitality, sharing hospitality, opening up your home to a stranger that you know nothing about. Be careful doing that, but scripture tells you to be hospitable. Do you love your enemies? Are you willing to do good to those who hate you? Are you going to bless them instead of cursing them? Are you going to pray for them instead of wanting to abuse them back? Because that's the heart of the matter. Romans 12 verse 9, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. It's a mindset, a heart set, put into action that you would be willing to turn even a cheek to be slapped. Doesn't mean to do it every single time and be abused. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live, with, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, do, but be willing to associate with people in low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This is the way of Jesus Christ. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. But leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on your head. So now Paul is telling the world, here is the reason to do it. But even with the reason out there, I'm not going to do it if my heart isn't set on it. By being this way... And Peter said the same thing in 1 Peter 3. You're going to be a witness to them because they're going to say, why in the world would you turn your other cheek? Why would you pray for me? Uh, I, here's a challenge. If there's somebody you don't like in your life, sit down every day and take five minutes and pray for them. Guarantee you at the end of that 30 days, you'll have a different attitude and they might also, especially if you put it into action where you're turning enemies not only into friends, but into saved in the kingdom of heaven. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. There's the golden rule put into another form. Do unto others as you would want them to do to you. Do you understand this way? Is this the way of Christ or not? Is this what he's teaching us to live? Are you willing to do it? Or are there places where you're not willing? Again, you need to stop and pray about that. And understand that it is that mindset in your heart that motivates you to action. Agape love is not natural. It is supernatural. A love that is not deserved, but its motive is based on the pitiful state of someone else, and you want to improve that state with the ultimate improvement being saved from their sin, saved from God's wrath because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So do you have that love? Do you have enough of that love to live that way? Do you have enough love to show them enough that their soul means something to you and you don't want them to spend an eternity in hell? 
It's contrary to the law, but it's not. Exodus 21, verse 23. But if there's serious injury, you're, you, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. And you've heard that said. And there are times for that. But we're not talking about the law. We're not talking about your tithe. We're talking about mercy and grace shown to you so that you will have mercy and grace for others and you will do it. Your mindset must be like Christ so that your actions will be like Christ so that the results will be heavenly. Remember, this life that you live is the only hell you'll ever see. It's also the only heaven some will see because of the way you live. So in Luke chapter 6, verse 32, if you love those who love you, what credit is that then? Love without actions, right? Even if you love them, what credit is that you? Even sinners love those who love them. You love people that are kind and nice to you. Jesus is calling for a higher standard. If you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. If you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Now, I've got plenty I can put into this category, but how many do I have in the other category where I lend without expecting payment and where I don't demand back what was taken from me? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But you who are listening... You who have been called, you have, who have said, I will follow you, Jesus. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. Jesus is crystal clear on what it means to follow him. And the rewards that you will receive by being an obedient disciple following in the footsteps of Jesus. Then your reward will be great and you'll be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your heavenly Father is merciful. So it's time for an evaluation. At least it is for me. Do I have the mindset of Christ? Am I focused on the things of this world? Do I have a heart of compassion, a heart of love? enough to get out of my comfort zone to do things, to pray for them, or to take a challenge to pray for someone like that? Am I willing to give up some of my time, some of my money, whatever it might be, to help others out just to simply help them out because they need it? And then because I have lived such a way, if it comes up, because that's going to be driven by the Holy Spirit again, I can't force salvation on them, but when, when they come and ask me, there might be the opportunity where the Holy Spirit is sending them to me. Because I have lived like Christ in this world, now I can be His witness. So how am I loving my enemies? Am I doing good? Am I blessing them? Am I praying for them? Father in heaven, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You also for the Holy Spirit who does not only seal us for that day of judgment and for that day of rejoicing, when Jesus will return and claim those that are Him, that He will separate the sheep from the goats, that He will re hand out rewards and we, we will be accountable for everything that we've done in this flesh, Father. May You empower us to be like Christ. May You change our minds, and that means that we have to leave the things of this world behind that we need to reach to Jesus, to put our eyes on Jesus and not to be longingly looking back like the children did in the wilderness, Lord. May we be satisfied with daily bread or whatever you provide for, the, for us. May we know that in all things, in sickness and in health, in chains or in freedom, Lord, that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Father, we thank you for sending your one and only Son. We thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross, for the joy there. We thank you for the resurrection to know that, that Jesus was the first fruits and that we will follow after death, that death has no sting for us. We thank you for the promise that every tear will be wiped away. 
Increase our faith. Help us not to lean to our own understandings, but to, to be patient in your time to not practice vengeance, but to know that it is yours, but instead to practice an, a love that we don't understand except that you first loved us. Increase that love in our hearts as a call to action for one another, not only in the body of believers, but even to our enemies, Father, that they may see Christ in us. We thank you and praise you for the life that Jesus lived, for the teachings that he gave us that expounded so much upon the law that you had given us that was for our good. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.